Good afternoon to everyone. My name is David Donoghue. On behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I'd like to welcome you to today's event with Professor Jeffrey Sachs, which is entitled Building Back Better, Sustainability Post-COVID-19. Jeffrey Sachs is, as you all know, a renowned economist, author, educator, and one of the world's leading authorities uh, on sustainable development, as I can personally attest. Jeff is director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. He's president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and he is uh, a UN advocate for the Sustainable Development Goals. We're delighted that he has been able to take time out of uh, his extremely busy schedule to speak to us today. Today's event is the sixth in the IIEA's Development Matters series, which is supported by Irish Aid, the Irish government's development cooperation program. First, some housekeeping points. Uh, Professor Sachs and I will have a, a, a an introductory conversation for the first 20 minutes or so, covering a number of broad questions. And then we will go to Q&A with our audience. The event, I should make clear, is entirely on the record. The audience will be able to join via the Q&A function on Zoom, which you'll see on your screens. And please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the session as, as they occur, and we will come to them or to as many of them as we can in the time available. Um, we'll do so when, our, when we've finished the initial conversation. Please feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We are also live streaming this afternoon's discussion. So a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining uh, via YouTube. I would now invite uh, Michelle Winthrop, who is the policy director at Irish Aid, to offer some words of introduction. Michelle, please. Many thanks, David. Um, good afternoon, friends, colleagues. And um, I'm delighted to be here today for this Development Matters lecture. And I I'd like to welcome Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Ireland has been supporting the IIEA to hold these seminars for some time now. Um, and now that we have gone virtual, we are um, really glad to see that the engagement is continuing on a, in a virtual format, if not in fact um, increasing. A little bit of feedback there. Um, special thanks in particular to Professor Sachs for being here today. Um, Professor Sachs is, is, of course, no stranger to Ireland. Um, in fact, I'm probably disclosing too much by telling you that I have a distant memory of attending a lecture by Professor Sachs, I believe, in about 1993 in Trinity, um, particularly on the subject of uh, post-communist transition economics. And indeed, we may reflect on how much the world has changed since then. Um, more recently, much more recently, uh, Professor Sachs, I know we relied a lot on your insights um, and ambition as we as we worked together to uh, to uh, shape the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 jointly with Kenya. Um, particularly now, as we enter the decade of action um, during this unprecedented time, I think we're particularly uh, looking forward to your thoughts on on uh, prospects for global progress towards the 2030 agenda. The topic of today's event is building back better. It is fair to say, I think, that the world has changed drastically in recent months. Every aspect of our lives has been impacted by COVID-19. And of course, all countries are, are feeling the impacts. I think we're particularly conscious, of course, that developing countries are, are especially at risk. Um, many started out this year with existing weak health, education, social protection systems and many indeed faced a high debt burden to start with. Of course, many are exposed to external risks more than others, uh, such as climate change, political instability. We are still learning about how COVID-19 will impact on the SDGs and the architecture that supports their achievement. But I think we are beginning to see some emerging fault lines in social, political and economic systems. And I think now is a great opportunity to really consider opportunities for, for alternative approaches as we make progress towards the SDGs. Professor Sachs, we're very interested to hear your wisdom and your views on how we can harness this period of recovery to develop sustainable and equitable solutions. Ireland recognises the need for coordinated action to save lives and save livelihoods, 
But it's also important to ensure that eventual economic recovery is inclusive and sustainable and helps build resilience to the, in the future, particularly for communities. We are also, of course, deeply committed to the importance of the multilateral system to reach those furthest behind, but also to help us navigate multiple complexities, complex, complexities that existed prior to the virus, that have been caused by the virus, and indeed that have been exacerbated by our attempts to control the virus. So I'm very much looking forward to this discussion today and, and thank you again for your time. Thanks very much. Uh, well, th thank you very much to IIEA for having me back and I look forward to uh, the conversation with uh, David when uh, he gets that mute button turned off. Uh, David played a, an enormous role, a unique role uh, in bringing us the sustainable development goals. So it will be a special treat to be uh, discussing the status of the goals with him. Uh, clearly, we're uh, in a very deep crisis globally, uh, though uh, less of a crisis than we were before November 3, because our perhaps uh, most important uh, crisis is a crisis of governance. And when the uh, center country of the international system, uh, the United States, is uh, poorly governed, uh, nothing else works. Uh, so we have been suffering uh, the uh, collapse of multilateralism because we've had in under the Trump uh, government uh, a rampant and reckless attack on multilateralism, including uh, the withdrawal of the United States from the World Health Organization uh, this year, uh, the withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, cuts uh, that are very irresponsible to development assistance and so forth. Uh, now we have a new president-elect uh, with the Irish descent. That's always uh, great uh, news and great promise. Uh, and uh, I think we can therefore really turn to the theme of uh, today's discussion, which is uh, building back better, because now we have the prospect of uh, really doing that uh, in a cooperative way. There are obviously two huge challenges uh, that the world faces. The first is to stop the pandemic. Uh, and uh, remarkably, uh, part of the world has done that. The uh, most of the Asia Pacific region uh, lives almost without uh, the virus now. Uh, this is something for us in Ireland and the United States and in uh, Europe to contemplate. Why is it that uh, many countries have gotten this completely under control, whereas it is out of control uh, in our country? So that's the first challenge is stopping the pandemic. The second challenge is then uh, taking some lessons from uh, the pandemic to reorient our economic and social policies. Uh, the pandemic uh, is not only a disaster, it is a wake up call to the weakness of our governments, uh, to the weakness of being able to heed warnings, uh, to the weakness uh, of our systems of engaging uh, science and expertise on behalf of uh, human well being, because this has been a huge failure uh, during this past year uh, in Europe and the United States. Uh, so, we need to heed the lessons of the pandemic for uh, redirecting our politics. And uh, specifically, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, and the Convention on Biological Diversity, the important things that the world has agreed to uh, were, were agreed to for real reasons uh, over the past 20 years, and we need to take them seriously going forward. So uh, in our discussion, I hope we talk about governance challenges, how we are more serious about following through on the things that we promise to do. And as I'll describe, and I see David is back online, uh, uh, through <clears throat> making real plans, basing those plans on real evidence and data, uh, mobilizing the financing that is needed to uh, implement those plans, 
uh, and then living up to uh, what we uh, aim to accomplish. It's all rather straightforward uh, mm -hmm. and uh, rational, I would say, but uh, our politics have not been rational. Uh, so I think the biggest uh, challenge is uh, to restore rationality to our politics, meaning linking uh, means and ends. Uh, and with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement, we have some very clear goals in mind. And we'll talk about uh, how those can be achieved in specific. But the main point I'm making is that we have to decide that we're going to act to achieve the goals that we've set. And by doing so, that will define the course ahead. David, uh, welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> so I know. I'm saying that the uh, most common sentence in the English language uh, these days is you're on mute, uh, which uh, despite uh, Zooming uh, every day, many times a day for recent months, I find myself often speaking <laughs> on mute, but uh, glad to be back with you. So I will turn it back over to you. Oh, now you're on mute again. Now, okay, you can hear me now. Now we can, absolutely. Okay. Apologies to, uh, for my unavoidable absence. Very, very sorry. Jeff, um, I mean, there are many uh, avenues of, it, of interest there. The, the, how do you see us actually, I mean, international cooperation is clearly uh, a, 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 a must in order to re restore momentum um, for implementation of the SDGs. But although the arrival of the new administration in the US is uh, hugely encouraging, we have nevertheless seen um, uh, a growth in populism and nationalism uh, over the last four years since the SDGs were signed. I ask myself how we can actually um, restore the momentum that we had in 2015 with the Paris Agreement, with the SDGs. So if you like, almost before we get to COVID, um, is there, uh, what can we do to actually galvanize the international or re-galvanize the international commitment towards achieving the SDGs? Well, let, let me say uh, that populism does not work. Uh, it does not uh, improve the well-being of uh, the, the people in whose name these populists pretend to speak. Trump uh, now has uh, presided over 244,000 deaths in the United States. We have uh, about 330 cases per million, more than 100,000 per day. Trump, uh, I, I won't... Uh, belabor the point more, but uh, he is a, a mentally disordered individual uh, who is called a populist, but he is creating death uh, throughout the country and mayhem. Uh, and uh, a wonderful uh, Irish scholar, Ian Hughes, uh, uh, has written about uh, disordered minds uh, in high places in politics and uh, the profound tragedies that they cause. So I think we need to start with populism uh, as, as a concept. Populists uh, are uh, these days uh, people with disordered minds who are not operating rationally, uh, who through their demagoguery uh, have power, but they cause destruction. Most of the people don't want destruction of themselves, their families, their livelihoods. So we need to get back to serious politics meaning uh, solutions for uh, the public that are real solutions, uh, not games of power. Uh, even today, by the way, I'm sorry to be obsessed with it, but the Republican leaders like uh, McConnell uh, and, uh, and uh, Cruz and uh, Graham in the United States uh, are playing to Trump's fantasy that there's some vote fraud and so on. This kind of irrationality is killing our country literally these days because every day that we waste on this, there are another thousand dead. There's another day of neglect of uh, a pandemic that is raging out of control. And it's not a game despite what these politicians think. So this is uh, the, the point that I'd like to say to Boris Johnson. I'd like to say to Bolsonaro. 
uh, I would like to say to the other populace, stop, you're not there for your own amusement. You're not there for power. You're there because the public needs public goods and services for its survival and its well-being. And when we don't get that, we face disaster. And we in the West should reflect how badly we've done this year, how flawed our politics are, mm. because this pandemic is controllable. Why is it that Taiwan has no cases right now? Uh, Australia and New Zealand, countries familiar to us in culture, uh, language, and all the rest have no cases right now. Uh, China, no cases. Korea, basically no cases, because they've had government that has just rationally done the job. Whereas I'm afraid that in our countries, it's been a debacle. Uh, Trump is such a maniac, but we're not the only one. So with that kind of lack of seriousness, we can't solve any problems. And it's not a coincidence to me that Trump totally bailed on trying to stop the pandemic, but he totally bailed on issues like climate change, made it up the same way. It'll get colder. It will go away. Firing the person in charge of, uh, of uh, climate reports just yesterday. Uh, you, you can't make this up. We're a country of 330 million people uh, with the greatest scientific uh, expertise in history, and a madman is running around firing the scientists in the government. Uh, and this is called the 21st century. So every other goal falls by the wayside when we have this kind of madness, which we have. So I would just say to the public, elect politicians who are rational, who are calm, who are committed to listening to expertise, who are committed to being transparent and honest, because this is not a game of how you can defeat your opponents or get an, an extra tax deal. This is about our lives, our survival, our well being. And we need to understand this is not one part of America against another, or one part of Ireland against another, or one part of Britain against another. This is us together grappling with problems that are hitting the whole society. So this is fundamentally a governance challenge. Once that's accepted, David, then of course there are real complexities. That's the first point. None of us understands in technical detail what needs to be done, except in narrow areas of our expertise. What we need to do is to understand who to talk to, how to consult, how to be transparent about it, how to hear hard truths that the politicians don't want to hear. Sometimes it's the truth that things are going to cost more than we say, or that we have to do more things, or that we have to raise taxes, the great bugaboo of our time, because everybody wants the money in their pocket. No one wants the social obligations that are part of making a society work. And all of that means evidence, deliberation, government reports. And this is my message to the Biden administration also. I don't want to see a raft of laws and uh, other things done without public deliberation. I want to see reports, studies, evidence, so that we're following a rational pursuit, not just Democrats beating Republicans or Republicans beating Democrats, or as my crazy country is doing today on a new show that I was on this morning, already starting to talk about the 2024 election. What yeah. is this, amusement park or, or life? So I think that this is the point, but enough preaching. Maybe we could talk about some specifics. Yeah. Um, Jeff, yes, you, you've been very eloquent on the, the governance uh, uh, problems which, which uh, stand in the way of an effective response to COVID and also to uh, implementing the SDG uh, agenda. Are there, are there macroeconomic constraints as well? Are there, are there I mean, we're, it, because of the pandemic, budgets are collapsing, resources are extremely uh, uh, strained. 
uh, are we, will we be facing challenges like those as well in terms of moving the SDGs forward? Uh, countries can reasonably say that their, their own uh, fabrics have been uh, stretched uh, unbearably by COVID and therefore the, the SDGs are almost a luxury. Or can one see the SDGs as the blueprint for the recovery? I think uh, we should understand where is the income and wealth in our world right now. Uh, already it was lopsided, but during COVID, the greatest uh, redistribution of wealth from, uh, from lower incomes to higher incomes has taken place in a short period of time. This morning, uh, if you look at uh, Bloomberg.com on its billionaires list, you'll find that uh, five people in the world uh, have uh, $600 billion of personal wealth, five people. Uh, you'll find that uh, Mr. Bezos alone of Amazon uh, has uh, about $190 billion of personal wealth. You'll find that the top 500 richest people in the world have, hold your seats, $7 trillion of wealth and since January 1st, these 500 people have had an increase of their wealth of $1 trillion, 500 people. That's where the money is. We need to be taxing Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, the other big tech companies. You know, uh, Ireland uh, has resisted uh, collecting uh, the tax on Apple, for example, uh, 14 billion is in the bank. My advice to Ireland, take the money, please. Ireland has, uh, Ireland needs the funding, uh, give half of it to Irish aid so it can do uh, the work around the world, use the other half right at home, but stop agonizing about Apple's fate, for God's sake. This is the richest company in the world. And our governments urgently need funding. So what the, the, the Ireland has been in wringing its hands. We don't want your taxes. We want to show we're a good low tax country. We're so good, we'll be a tax haven. Don't be a tax haven, collect taxes, provide social services, use a, half of that money to help save the world from hunger and starvation. And thank uh, Apple for uh, providing good products and uh, then paying its taxes. And we need to do the same with all of these companies. But we're in a, in a mind warp, uh, David, because something maybe about the, the human mentality, uh, these people are so rich that they are, uh, it's almost an idolatry uh, that they're, they're looked at as untouchable. Mm. Uh, but that's where the money is. So we need to tax them. We need wealth taxation. If you have 500 people with $7 trillion of wealth, uh, it's simple arithmetic to see that you could leave each of them $1 billion, which I have on good authority is, is, uh, is enough. Uh, you could leave each one with a billion and you'd have $6.5 trillion left over which we could use to feed every person on the planet, have every child in school, provide universal health coverage, achieve SDG3, SDG4, SDG2, SDG6, SDG7. And that's just 500 people that could do this. So I say all the time, Mr. Bezos, what do you need your $190 billion? Okay, you've made a very good company, but you don't need $190 billion. And the world is hungry and suffering right now. And, you know, I, I have here, uh, uh, I read it uh, I'm in, in the middle of an investigation of competition in digital markets by the US House Judiciary mm -hmm. Committee, showing how these companies have used their monopoly power to take over their markets. So there's also, we shouldn't uh, be mystical about this. These are powerful companies making huge, huge, huge profits. And then our governments are bereft of revenues, but Ireland is uh, so vividly saying, we don't even want your revenues. And then it's saying, we don't have a budget to meet our domestic needs. It doesn't make sense.
Take the money, please. Well, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. That leads us uh, neatly into um, a question from Brendan Walsh of IDA Ireland, who thanks you warmly for your, your talk. And he's curious to have your thoughts on the role of, of uh, large financial institutions uh, in achieving and implementing the SDGs, and more broadly, the potential of sustainable finance as a sector for financial services. So, uh, Jeff, if you'd like to take that one, I mean, the, the, the Apple discussion is certainly one that has ebbed back and forth in, in Ireland a lot. Uh, I, I, I won't attempt to, 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 to uh, enter into it, but um, if you could respond to what Brendan was asking uh, about the financial institution, that would be great. Let me say hi to Brendan first and thank him for the question uh, and uh, uh, say the following. First, uh, we need to make a big, big distinction between the kinds of SDGs that require uh, outright budgetary outlays versus the kinds of SDGs that require investment finance. So uh, when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to education, when it comes to nutrition, these are budgetary outlays not to be financed by private investment. There's the return is a social return. The return is lives saved, children educated, uh, but there's not a direct income uh, that you collect uh, as the counterpart to that financing. And so you don't run a school system through public borrowing or you don't run a healthcare system through public borrowing, you run it through revenues of the budget. On the other side, if we're investing in clean energy, wind power, solar power, as part of the energy transition, those are bankable projects. And then comes the question for the large financial institutions, are you investing in those or are you investing in uh, oil, gas, and coal, for example. So we know that in order for climate safety to be achieved, we need to decarbonize the energy system. We need to move from the fossil fuels to wind, solar, hydro, geothermal power. And then the question is, where is the responsibility for that? Well, first it starts with government to make the rules of the game. And Europe really should be commended for the European Green Deal. It is the best blueprint for decarbonization on the planet today. And I hope that Biden will put forward a comparable plan shortly. Then comes the financing of that transformation. And a lot of that will be private market. Now, if this is the law of the land to decarbonize, to some extent, the investors don't have a choice. You're not allowed to build new fossil fuel plants if the regulations are put in place properly. But I would also say to investors, why would you invest in fossil fuels right now when the principle is to decarbonize? And uh, maybe some investors will say, well, that's fine, Professor Sachs, but you say it's to decarbonize, but we're not really going to do it. And I would say to you that if you look over the last 10 years, the single worst investment you could have made would have been in fossil fuels. Uh, it has been absolutely the surest way to lose money. And I said that 10 years ago, I said that five years ago, and I'm gonna say it today again. It's not just a matter of doing good, it's a matter of do you wanna lose all your money? Because if you invest in fossil fuels more, your assets will be stranded. They will be prevented from use, maybe in 2025 or 2030 or 2035, but you're gonna be shut down. Peabody Coal uh, today is in the Financial Times uh, on the verge of bankruptcy. Good riddance. It's a coal company, we don't need coal. Coal was okay in 1800. Coal is not okay in the year 2020, period. Go, leave Peabody. We don't want you and need you. Your workers will help. That's a just transition. But we've got to move on. And now that wind and solar are such low cost, 
we know how to move on. And so this is the basic point I would say to the investment community. First, be smart, see where the world is going. Look ahead because that's what investors are supposed to do. Don't look at the, uh, at, at the propaganda of ExxonMobil and ConocoPhillips and others that say, oh, we're gonna continue the same way as we are. ExxonMobil fortunately is shrinking away it used to be the great giant, it's disappearing. The faster, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Unless it becomes the Exxon Wind Company, which would be fantastic. It's actually got the skill to do it, just like uh, Statoil became Equinor, and now uh, is making the offshore wind off the US Northeast. So uh, this is what I would say to investors, be smart. The world will not tolerate product lines that are destructive of the planet. And so all of this reporting is important guidelines for being smart in this. And I would say to the business community, the big problem with what I'm saying, of course, is that the business community lobbies, uh, they delay change that needs to be made, they propagandize, they, uh, uh, they run advertisements about how much ExxonMobil loves nature, uh, and all of this nonsense. Uh, so they delay the clarity, they fund campaigns in the United States. By the way, this election cycle was $14 billion in campaign expenditures. You know how much corruption uh, that means, 14 billion changed hands. Uh, so this is where our real problem is. But to the investors, don't, be, don't try to be cute uh, and game reality. Mm -hmm face the facts that we're moving in a new direction. Thanks, Jeff. Um, one of the areas which clearly it, it requires huge investment is, is nutrition and, and food security. And I mean, it, it, clearly that area has suffered a lot under COVID. Uh, Tom Arnold, who's a former Director General of the IIA, has a question, what importance do you attach to the Food Systems Summit next year? Well, Tom is uh, one of the great leaders of sustainable hello. development. So, uh, hello, Tom. Uh, I was just talking about you a couple of days ago because I need your advice on some <laughs> on some things uh, uh, like the Constitutional Assembly of uh, Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the the hunger crisis is deep, and I believe uh, larger than we know, because uh, hunger is the kind of thing that is uh, first uh, largely silent. Uh, of the most powerless. Uh, it's sometimes not noted. Uh, it's certainly micronutrient deficiencies uh, are not uh, something that's uh, screamed uh, in the headlines or the data. And especially undernutrition of young children with growing brains is devastating. And I'm sure that it's happening right now more than we know. So one thing that Ireland might <laughs> that I would recommend because Ireland's long been a leader in this area is connect with the FAO and the World Food Program and try to uh, promote better surveillance uh, right now, much more survey data on what people are actually eating, how hungry they are, so that we're not just learning in a survey a year from now or two years from now how bad it is, but that we can see immediately what is really happening on the ground. The reason for fear is that remittance income has collapsed, tourist income has collapsed, uh, retail trade, uh, petty trade uh, has uh, been hugely disrupted. Uh, so there's every reason to believe that the incomes of the poor have plummeted and therefore that their food insecurity has soared. But we won't see it uh, until there are riots or deaths or new waves of disease, but we ought to see it in real time so that we can respond to it. And then what to do? My own advice is any place that we see uh, a growing hunger hotspot right now, uh, the IMF should give an emergency financing uh, to that country for use to address within days and weeks the hunger crisis. We're not in a food shortage in the macro physical uh, levels. The supply chains did not collapse 
uh, in the way of preventing us from getting food to people that need it. It's the incomes that have collapsed. And we need not to delay on that or even to wait for development aid, which is slow moving and, and uh, difficult. In other words, to increase that envelope in the very short term, we need the IMF to essentially be extending credits uh, on an emergency basis so that finance ministers don't feel uh, that they can't afford to address the hunger crisis. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, turning to health, um, uh, do you see the US uh, rapidly uh, uh, resuming support for WHO? I mean, what will the attitude of the Biden administration be, do you think? I think uh, on the very first day of uh, the Biden administration, we'll be back in uh, the World Health Organization. I would be shocked if it last, if it took even 48 hours. Uh, this is something that the president can do uh, on his own authority. Uh, and I expect that that would be uh, one of the very first uh, actions uh, on January 20th uh, of the president. Uh, Biden understands multilateralism. He understands the destructiveness of uh, and the petulance and the mean spiritedness and the pure sheer domestic politics involved in uh, Trump pulling out of WHO. It's all a game to deflect blame from China. Uh, and so it had no substantive merit, but Trump uh, clinically uh, is uh, sociopathic. And so there's no remorse or feeling for the damage caused. Uh, and it's the, that combination of uh, uh, political evil and uh, sociopathy that really explains this. We'll be back in WHO. Uh, again, what I really want to emphasize is that even before we get a vaccine, this is a controllable epidemic. And by the way, Ireland should have it under control because Islands have a much better uh, feasibility of control uh, than uh, countries uh, on uh, mainland continents uh, that have land borders. So with Ireland, I really urge you to uh, double down on the public health measures, uh, the face masks, physical distancing, massive scale up of testing and contact tracing, uh, and, uh, you know, take a uh, take some guidance from Taiwan or from uh, from Korea or New Zealand uh, or others that have beaten it down to zero. Uh, maybe uh, Prime Minister Ardhern of uh, New Zealand could uh, also give some tips to the Taishuk uh, about what to do, but you could get it down to zero. Uh, use the island advantage. Uh, to uh, really control the pandemic and show the rest of us how fast this can be brought under control. Uh, I think this is uh, what Biden is going to try to do. Of course, the U.S. with 330 million uh, people is uh, much more complicated. But, you know, in Ireland, there was lots of uh, really pernicious uh, videos coming out. I don't remember uh, the individual's name, but uh, there was one person saying we've already reached herd immunity. Uh, it was a, almost a virally uh, watched video. It was a bunch of nonsense, terrible, phony uh, uh, claims just as the second wave exploded. And uh, we can do better than that. And Ireland is uh, filled with the good public health specialists this is really controllable and really worth controlling. Jeff, more, more generally, um, how do you assess the prospects for achieving more effective multilateralism uh, now with, with, with a Biden administration there? I mean, obviously, uh, it, that requires a high degree of international consensus. And if, as we look around the landscape at present, clearly there, there will be greater tensions uh, between the US, for example, and Russia and China uh, than we've had over the last four years. Uh, but that's just one example. I mean, we all want to see more effective multinationalism. Do you think it is realistically achievable um, over the coming years? And 
Cuiva de Barra, who is the head of Trocra, a leading Irish development organization, uh, makes the point that we will be joining the Ireland will be a member of the Security Council uh, as of January. And uh, she suggests that we might have a role uh, to play in relation to supporting a more effective multilateralism as a member of the Security Council. Any thoughts you have on that would also be appreciated. Thank you for uh, being on the Security Council. This is extremely, extremely important at this moment. I, I, the, the main message I would uh, urge is no Cold War with China. Uh, this kind of anti-China drumbeat of uh, Pompeo and Trump has been extraordinarily dangerous uh, and extraordinarily obnoxious in my view. Uh, you know, okay, China does this, China does that, China's the great evil. This is a part of uh, American evangelism. We always need an enemy, uh, whether the enemy was uh, the Soviet Union or Vietnam uh, or uh, uh, the global war on terror uh, or Saddam Hussein, uh, the United States always needs an enemy. Uh, and uh, Pompeo, who is, uh, in my view, simple-minded uh, and nasty, uh, uh, and, and a uh, really a fundamentalist uh, who believes in uh, imminent Armageddon uh, was stoking this kind of conflict with China. China is not our enemy. This is the most important point. China wants global cooperation, needs global cooperation, and we should be cooperating. It's not as if every issue is easily solved. But of course, China is a major power. It's got major interests and it's got 1.4 billion people with a huge amount of talent. Uh, and we should be cooperating with China to stop the pandemic. We should be cooperating with China to address climate change because they're the number one emitters of greenhouse gases. Uh, we should be uh, jumping uh, for, with enthusiasm that President Xi Jinping announced at the General Assembly in September that China is committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2060. I want to nudge that forward to 2050 because China can do it by 2050 and it should do it by 2050. But these are grounds for cooperation. And uh, one of the bad ideas that uh, some people around Biden have is we need a new coalition of democracies to fight uh, the autocracies stop the divisions. Let's work with other countries uh, and not emphasize right now the divisions, but emphasize the common interests so that we can practically solve problems. We're exhausted in the United States. Uh, this is no time for a crusade. Mm -hmm. This is time actually to solve our domestic problems <laughs> and to understand that other countries have domestic problems and that if we work together, we'll help each other to accelerate the progress. So. I would really hope that Ireland would be that voice of reason to say to the big powers, get along with each other. Uh, and uh, I think that this is really important. I'm not a fan of uh, you know every, every, every leader of every big power, uh, but I am really a fan of us taking a breath and stopping the conflicts. Uh, of course, we shouldn't turn a blind eye if there's cross-border aggression. That's what the UN is for. Uh, but if it's merely pointing, you're evil, you're this, you're that, that's not helpful. Uh, what is uh, much more helpful is to say, we have all agreed on the sustainable development goals. We've all agreed on the Paris Climate Agreement. What together are we going to do about this? We are all reeling from COVID. What together are we going to do about this? Uh, and I think that uh, this approach could make uh, really a, a, a big difference. Biden will be very good on much of this uh, from the start because we'll go back to the UN, we'll go back to WHO, we'll go back to the Paris Agreement. I hope we'll go back to UNESCO right away because uh, we certainly should do that as well. Uh, but, uh, there is a more hardline track or uh, you know hard uh, uh, liberalism uh, which says we have to oppose the autocracies 
we need to make the world safe for democracy and so forth. And this is, uh, this is just too simple minded, I'm sorry. Uh, we need to cooperate across uh, the world right now to solve problems and not to be uh, running a race about who's uh, more saintly and who's more evil, uh, but actually uh, very pragmatically working to address the, the challenges that are so huge in front of us. So I'm excited uh, for uh, the new Security Council. Let me, let me say that. Thank you, Jeff. Well, I'm sure Ireland will want to play the kind of uh, role of reasonable intermediary, which you've been suggesting. That's very much in, in our diplomatic tradition. Uh, Jeff, just a final point on uh, multilateralism. Simon Carswell of the Irish Times wonders re really whether the huge divisions we've seen uh, reflected in the respective votes for Trump and Biden, whether they carry over to the issue of effective multilateralism. I mean, is the American public itself divided on the issue? You, perhaps if you could just briefly address that point, and then we'll end with a number of questions focused more on SDGs and financing. Well, first to say that in the election campaign, foreign policy was uh, mentioned for about three minutes, 12 seconds. So uh, I don't think that uh, the American people have a burning desire about anything uh, internationally right now. Uh, I don't know if they're aware of the rest of the world or not, but it's not a top issue. Uh, it's easy to stoke American fear. Uh, this is uh, obvious. Uh, my country is not the most sophisticated country in geography, in history, uh, or in almost anything else, I'm afraid. Uh, so uh, if you say there's a global war on terror, well, there's a global war on terror. If you say uh, that uh, these countries are the evil empire, well, then they're the evil empire, uh, whether Americans can identify them on the map or not. And so uh, in this sense, uh, there is an anti-China feeling right now. I watched it in shock, uh, frankly, because within four years, China went from a counterpart to an enemy uh, in, in uh, the casual rhetoric. And there shouldn't be casual rhetoric in this world when you're talking about nuclear superpowers. Uh, to start calling someone an enemy has consequences, uh, and, uh, but our politicians are inconsequential. Uh, unfortunately, and so they're, they're lax, they're lazy, they blamed uh, China for release of this virus and so many other absolutely senseless things. But the public, which doesn't care too much about this, hears and believes uh, often. So uh, I, I think the, the point is that um, the American public's not the constraint on foreign policy, but the, uh, this is really a more elite uh, activity and very much an executive uh, branch activity, which is why Trump could do so many things almost on a personalistic basis, because we have a flawed constitution uh, and an inattentive public. And it means that the president has a tremendous leeway in these areas. Uh, Congress, of course, can frustrate or Congress can beat the drums of war, which is also a great American tradition. Uh, so uh, lots can go wrong politically, but if but, but the, the main responsibility in our constitutional order, if one could call it that, is uh, is the president. The president is the one in the American system that has to stop going to war. Uh, I always think it's like a you know a souped up uh, car with the engine revving all the time. And the main job of the president is to keep the foot on the brake uh, because uh, otherwise the war machine will move forward. We'll go bomb someplace. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we need to stop that behavior because it keeps boomeranging on America and it keeps uh, creating waves of refugees in Europe. And it, it's just made a disaster. So uh, in this sense, uh, the, the, the long and the short of it is uh, we need responsibility at the top. Biden, fortunately, is very level-headed. Uh, he's a very uh, decent, serious man. And I just hope uh, that he doesn't have too many 
uh, hotshot uh, advisors who want to prove themselves by some regional war or conflict someplace. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, we might conclude with a number of questions more about the SDGs specifically. Uh, in no particular order, one relates to what advice you might have for the SME sector uh, in a country like Ireland, which is trying to progress the SDGs within their own local economies. And, and, and uh, uh, another question relates really to, um, uh, to debt uh, uh, relief uh, comes to Eamon Casey uh, 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 of Mission Cara. Um, uh, the issue of debt, public and private, and debt sustainability in terms of its potential impact on fi financing for development and achievement of the SDGs. Uh, a third question relates to your views on what the World Bank and IMF and others can do to support the, the restructuring or writing off of LDC's debt, which is owed to private creditors. Um, I just give you one final one really uh, what's this is from jerry mcavilly of coalition 2030 in ireland um what steps should governments take to improve governance uh, coherence and accountability in relation to the stgs in their domestic policy making um uh, for example the issue the extent to which uh, stg targets should be systematically considered. I mean, I have to say, this is one of my own hobby horses that there's, uh, but can we do more to, to uh, encourage systematic handling of SDG goals and targets? That should see us out. If you were good enough to respond to those, we'd be very, we'd be very grateful. A absolutely. So let me start uh, with, with the, the end, which is uh, governments should plan for achieving the SDGs. Uh, and at this point, uh, the Irish government or the new Biden administration or others should have a 10-year framework that says, here's where we want to be in 2030, whether it's with schooling, with healthcare, with the energy system, uh, with the land, sustainable land use, and ask the question uh, in a uh, transparent and uh, expert manner, what would it take to get from here to where we want to be in 2030 uh, in terms of policies, public investments, and the financing to accomplish this. Uh, so this, I think, is the first point. Make a framework. Use uh, the great universities of Ireland, and there are so many wonderful uh, institutions, uh, to work on these challenges. Uh, invite uh, expert uh, groups to submit ideas about how to reach 2030 in a particular area. Uh, but harness the information and the knowledge in the society uh, in a creative way. And Ireland's just the right size to do this well. Uh, and with so much talent that I would say uh, 2021 can be a great learning experience for the country. Here are things we can fix. Here's what we promise to do. Here's how we are part of the European Green Deal. Uh, here are the challenges that are still unmet where we ought to put in our R&D and so forth. Within that context, SMEs will find their place uh, because uh, this will be the new economy. In general, I believe that we are moving to a digital world. So digitization within the SMEs, I think is a basic a point uh, and and Ireland is very much part of the information uh, technology in in all ways. You've got all the headquarters uh, and uh, links between the U.S. and Europe on on many of the key uh, digital sectors and digital technologies. That is crucial for achieving the SDGs. Think about what that means for digital health, for digital education, for digital governance, uh, for digital payments. Uh, these are the growth areas of, of the economy, and I think very promising ways to achieve the SDGs. On the questions of debt and the World Bank and the IMF, I think the basic point is uh, we will uh, exit COVID uh, probably in 2021 with a global financial structure completely out of kilter. Huge budget deficits, large public debts, uh, 
an overhang of bad debts in many countries uh, and uh, really uh, a financial need for more government revenues, uh, an international tax system that is a, a sieve uh, rather than a, a collection bowl. Uh, and uh, all of this requires uh, rethinking the international financial system. All the pieces are around in the debate right now. The need for new uh, SDR allocation, the, uh, uh, the case for permanent uh, uh, debt relief, uh, the OECD's plans on uh, taxation of the digital economy and so forth. All of it has been blocked by Trump up until now. Uh, so one by one, the proposals on the table have been blocked by the Trump administration uh, on the America first principle. Don't you dare attack us. We will put uh, uh, duties on your goods. We'll break you. Uh, Trump's gone. We can get back to rational discussion. I rather think uh, just like we had Vatican II, I think we need a Bretton Woods II. Uh, in the future, probably uh, starting in 2022, 2023. It could be like Vatican II that it uh, goes on for two or three years, but we need uh, really to think holistically about finance, digital currencies, uh, debt management, uh, tax reform, ending tax havens. We need to make the world suitable for sustainable development. We need an international financial system that is suitable for sustainable development. And that really does mean a new conference. It won't be in New Hampshire. Uh, it could be in Dublin or a nice place in Ireland. Uh, this could be, uh, we'd all love to come there. Uh, but I think that uh, this, this is uh, what I would recommend to uh, take a look at this issue. In the short term, I just want the IMF to give out credits to uh, meet emergency needs and not worry about the long term. But then I want us to have the accounting in 2022, 2023, where we say, okay, we're past that pandemic. Uh, we have built up uh, so many uh, uh, financial uh, instabilities and overhangs. Now we have to clean up uh, for a truly sustainable world. And so let's have a comprehensive view of international finances. Jeff, thank you very, very much for that. We promised to end on time. Uh, there are many, many more questions, as you can imagine. Uh, uh, you're always uh, uh, extremely stimulating across many, many fronts. Jeff, thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure as always. Uh, we hope that we will see you in person uh, before too long. Um, and. Um, uh, we um, were, were really grateful and apologies once again for the technical glitch earlier on. Uh, thank you for making the time available and we look forward to uh, our next encounter. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks to all the friends, David. Thanks so much to you, uh, Michelle. Thank you so Thanks. much.